What up? I'm Bee and welcome to my channel where we talk about all things true crime and current events. Today is another episode of Crafty Crimes where you and I sit down together, we talk about something related to the true crime world, and we do a little crocheting at the same time. Today's story is super interesting and I don't want to spoil anything, so let's just go ahead and get right into it. Back in 1991, there was a man named James Smiley. He was 33 years old and he lived in Laredo, Texas. Now, if you don't know where Laredo, Texas is, it is this teeny tiny little town on the border of Mexico in America. So Laredo is like right here and then about 30 minutes outside of Laredo when you cross the border is a town called Nuevo Laredo. And that's obviously in Mexico. Uh, and James lived in Laredo, so in America, and uh, he was working at an Arby's. He was a manager there, but he was also a Baptist youth counselor. So he wasn't like a pastor or anything, but he did a lot of like volunteer work for the church. He spent a lot of time there and he would often go across the border into Nuevo Laredo and volunteer at this orphanage that they had there. And he did this because he really kind of took a special interest, it appeared, in disadvantaged youth. Everyone in the church described him as just this incredible guy. He was always super giving, like always wanted to help and really wanted to make a difference and just, you know, his heart was kind of for kids. And so, you know, he was basically a pillar of the community is how someone might describe him. So in the same vein as that, James knew a 17 year old named Miguel Martinez and uh, Miguel worked under James at the Arby's that he managed and it seemed like James was giving Miguel a little bit of like special attention. He'd kind of uh, like taken a shine to him, wanted to really include him and maybe kind of mentor him is what it seemed like. You know, Miguel has said, I think it can be considered as him seeing somebody that needed a father or somebody that was disadvantaged and trying to help. And despite the kindness that it appeared James had extended to Miguel, uh, there wasn't really any loyalty on Miguel's end. <laughs> Miguel had this friend named Milo Flores who uh, in 1991 he was 17 as well and they had on more than one occasion gone to James's house and robbed it. And they were able to do this super easily because James had given Miguel a set of keys to his house. Like, Miguel's home life apparently wasn't the best. And so James had let Miguel, like, spend the night several times and he would drive him to work the next day. So Miguel had his own set of keys. Him and uh, Milo would go over to James's house when he wasn't home and they would just steal a few things so that way they could sell them and then use that money to buy alcohol or drugs. So Miguel Martinez and Milo Flores, they were really close friends, but they also had another friend named Miguel Venegas, and he was 16 years old at the time, and they, like, they were all, they were all buddies, but both Milo and uh, Miguel Martinez thought that Miguel was just a little bit too much. He was really erratic. He had, was very high energy and was always a little bit more aggressive than the other two, but they still got along pretty well. Going forward to avoid confusion on this, I'm going to call uh, Miguel Martinez Miguel and Miguel Venegas Venegas. So I'll, I'll call our first Miguel Miguel and our second Miguel Venegas because that's his last name. So uh, Miguel and Venegas, they both lived uh, in pretty small homes with pretty big families and so they would always get together at Milo's house. Milo's dad was a state district judge and so they were pretty well off and then uh, Milo, it, kind of in the back of the house, he had what could be described as like an ensuite apartment. Like he had his own little area, his own room, like little kitchenette, stuff like that and so the three boys would get together they would play video games, they would drink beer, smoke weed, just, you know, do what 17 year olds do in small towns basically. And so the person who funded this was Milo. His dad gave him an allowance and he would spend that money on both weed and cocaine uh, for the three boys to do together. So on January 17th of 1991, the three boys were doing just that hanging out, having a good time, and uh, smoking weed, drinking beer, and 
doing a little bit of cocaine. And they got to a point where they were kind of bored, they were looking for something to do, and apparently Milo had get, gotten a little bit irritated with uh, Venegas, and he said that, like, you know, you're always coming over here, like, using my drugs, I'm the one who buys the drugs, you know, you don't contribute, basically, getting upset that Venegas, you know, he's not bringing any drugs over. So, Venegas was like, well, you know, I don't want to feel like a burden, and he was super high energy. He was already pretty amped. He said he'd been huffing glue that day. And so he was like, well, let's go rob somebody. And then we can either use that money or we can sell whatever we get and we'll buy drugs. And that will be my contribution. So at this point, Miguel Martinez was like, let's go ahead and rob James Smiley. And the reason that he suggested that was because, you know, they'd done it plenty of times before. They figured it would be a quick and easy errand. They could just in and out. They knew where his house was. They knew, you know, they had a key so they didn't have to break in. Nothing like that, you know. And so the other boys agreed. And then Venegas said that they should bring some type of weapons just in case James was home and they needed to threaten him a little bit. The other boys agreed to do this. And then Venegas took it one step further. And... You know, he said, well, if he's home, what if we just killed him? And apparently, Miguel Martinez and Milo's responses were, oh, no, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that. But the thing about Venegas is that he grew up in Mexico for like the majority of his life up until he was a teenager. He lived in Mexico. And that he had very recently moved to Laredo, Texas. And he said that he comes from a machista culture and that a dare is a dare. And so machista means literally, like the translation is male shamanist. And so it's like, you say I'm not going to do something, I'll show you, like I'm going to do it. They got some weapons, they grabbed uh, some axes and a few knives and headed over to James Smiley's house. Now before they went and did this, uh, Miguel Martinez said that he was not expecting James to be home. He didn't think it was going to be an issue. Uh, he was like, you know, this guy's never home when we go to rob him. He's never been home before, so he's not going to be home now. But, you know, if Venegas wants to take these weapons, I guess that's fine. So that's allegedly where his headspace was at. But like I said, they got the weapons. They were planning on roughing him up if necessary. They got in the car and they went to James's house. Now keep in mind, Miguel Martinez and Milo Flores, they are close friends. Venegas, on the other hand, is someone that they just happen to spend time with. He's prone to aggression. He gets pretty amped up pretty easily. And there's just something about him that Miguel Martinez and Milo Flores do not like. So Milo was the one who ended up driving them over to James's house. And he said, okay, like, you know, we're about a block away. I'm going to go ahead and drop you guys off. And then I'm going to find a good area to park the car. So that way we have the perfect getaway spot. So he lets them out. They start walking towards James's house. Milo starts to drive like he's going to find a spot. And then he leaves. Milo <laughs> was like, I, I'm pretty concerned about Venegas's comments about actually killing James and he's been pretty amped up this entire day and this entire night so I don't think I want to be part of this anymore and he dipped. Obviously not knowing this, Miguel Martinez and Venegas walked over to James's house and then Miguel Martinez says that when they first got there, like when they actually got to the house, he started having this really bad feeling. He was just feeling uneasy he was kind of scared and he just, he felt like something bad was going to happen. So uh, they get there and obviously they want to make sure that James isn't home. And Venegas goes up to the windows. And so he's looking through the windows, checking all around the house. And then he comes back and tells Miguel Martinez that there are three people inside. Now, James lived alone. So at most they were expecting one person there. But now that, now they've got three. And realizing that, you know, 
initially they thought nobody was going to be home. Then they're like, okay, well, you know, James might be home. We might have to rough him, rough him up a little bit. And now they're all the way at, there are three people all sleeping inside. And the Nagus is acting pretty excited about this. And Miguel is like, I, I feel this shift. I feel this change. This was supposed to be just a quick errand, get some stuff and get out. And, and now I think that something more really might happen. And Miguel Martinez, about this situation before they entered the house, he said uh, about Venegas, he was on a mission and it was not to steal anything. To him, he was on a mission from Satan. That's scary. And that seems like Miguel Martinez might just be acting a little bit dramatic, but... Venegas really did talk about Satanism a lot, and uh, he talked about how he was so closely associated with the devil. He tells the story about how where he lived in Mexico, there were tons of black widow spiders, and so one time when he was eight years old, he had captured a bunch of them in a jar, just completely filled this jar up full of black widow spiders. And then he took his shirt off, laid on the ground, and dumped the jar out onto himself, like onto his chest. And he said that um, because none of them ever bit him, he knew that he was the son of the devil. So Martinez knows about all of this. Venegas has spoken about it quite openly and quite honestly. And he says that at this point he was really scared and, and fearful of Venegas because he knew he wanted to do something violent, but he, for some reason, still decided to stay. And at this point, Venegas' thought process was, um, now everything's changed, I have to kill these three people. Then I remember when I was younger, and I say, more souls to the devil. With that, Venegas decided it was time to go inside and kill all three people. The three people inside the home. One of them was obviously James Smiley. The next was a young man who was 20 years old and his name was Ruben Martinez. And then the third was a 14 year old boy named Daniel Duenas. Uh, both of the latter two men were from Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. And it's not really clear why they were sleeping at James's house. Most people assume that what happened was either he met them through the orphanage or through a connection at the orphanage that he volunteered at in Nuevo Laredo. And once they got across the border, he was letting them stay at his house, uh, kind of get their bearings together and helping them get on their feet in America. So the two boys, Venegas and Miguel Martinez, entered the house and approached Ruben, who was going to be their first victim. Ruben was asleep on the couch, and according to Venegas, he woke up, looked Venegas right in the eyes, and went right back to sleep. Unfortunately, Venegas took that as a sign that the devil had his back. So, seeing that, he raised the axe up, because he was the one holding the axe, and uh, brought it down directly onto Ruben's skull and then he took one of the small knives that he had brought with him and just stabbed him repeatedly. When he was done with that, he told Miguel Martinez that it was now his turn and that he was supposed to stab the corpse. Miguel Martinez did as he was told and then when he was done, he went outside the back sliding door and just threw up everywhere. So while Miguel Martinez is doing that. Venegas starts going through the house, uh, going to get the other two people who are in there, and he enters the guest room, which is where Daniel's sleeping. He starts just stabbing Daniel with no, like, unceremoniously stabbing him in his sleep, and he claims that he didn't know that Daniel was so young or that he was a child until, um, he kind of woke up from being stabbed and started crying. And at this point, he, Venegas was like, oh, I didn't know it was a kid, but it's too late to stop now. And so he just kept stabbing him until he died. 
after he was done murdering Daniel, Benegas exited the guest room where he ran into Miguel Martinez and uh, basically scolded him for going out back and told him that he better not leave again until they were done with what it was they came here to do. He then went into the master bedroom where James Smiley was sleeping, murdered him with the axe, and then turned a crucifix that was on his bed table uh, upside down and left it there as kind of like homage to the devil. And then on the way out, the boy stole a TV and James's car and, and it seemed like that was going to be the end of it. N neither of them, um, neither Miguel Martinez nor Miguel Venegas did anything after that. It didn't seem like they, they felt bad or they were conflicted or anything like that. But a few weeks after the murder, the police are obviously still looking, still trying to figure out what happened, um, who, who could have done this. They don't really have any very good leads, but they are looking into the boys. And so they went over to uh, Milo Flores' house and talked to his dad, who was the judge at the time. And when his dad went to ask him about it, Milo basically just like spilled all the beans. He was like, okay, here's what happened. And he, he told his dad how he had talked them out of taking a gun over there and how um, he had like tried to convince them to take smaller and smaller weapons because they were like, oh, like these, like the kitchen knives, let's take those. And Milo was like, oh no, they're, they're pretty dull. We don't want to take those. So he was, he said that he was trying to talk them out of it, but you know, they wanted to get the weapons and they wanted to go to James's house and rough him up. And so uh, that's why he, he left. And basically uh, <laughs> telling his dad that got him off. Um, soon Venegas and Martinez were both arrested and Milo faced goose egg charges. And, and I think one of the most interesting parts of that is that even though he was never arrested, never charged, they, the, the police really had no interest in him for his part in the crime. He still has not spoken to any media outlets about it and has remained like completely out of the news. Just, I no one knows where he's at. What's he doing? What's he up to? I mean, obviously his family knows, but like media wise, nothing. His dad, however, uh, like will do interviews and, and he'll talk about it. And one of the things that really bothers him is the fact that Milo wasn't arrested. He, so he says, uh, apparently not going to trial really messed with both Milo's reputation and his dad's reputation because everybody was like, oh, well, your dad was a state district judge. And so that's why you got off. But uh, his dad said that he... He really would have preferred to him to have been accused and to face a jury and then be declared innocent because, quote, there were no facts that showed any guilt. And so that's where he is at. It, I can see how that would be rough if you didn't do anything to help your son get off. Like if it was just that the police weren't interested in him and, and for whatever reason that may be, um, whether it is because of who his father is or because, you know, whatever the culture is down there, who they're really focusing on, who knows. But I can see why that would bug you if you weren't directly involved in him not being charged. Anyway, Martinez and Benegas were both arrested. Martinez was 17 at the time of the murders, and so he was immediately tried as an adult. And this is kind of crazy and a his an historic moment. Martinez was convicted of capital murder, even though he did not actually kill anyone. He did stab a corpse, but he did not commit any of the murders. He was just there for them, which is horrible. But I do think it's interesting uh, because he was sentenced to death. And he, at the time, was the youngest person on death row within the state of Texas. So I just think that that's really intense like obviously what he did was horrible and he um there were a lot of points at which he could have stopped it but I'm like man should he be put to death for that like he didn't actually murder anybody and, and I don't know how long they were in the house for but it reminds me of uh the Shonda Sherer case where I, I'm compelled to think about 
what did I think about what Hope and, um, oh my gosh, what's her name? Lori? Hope and Lori. With them, I don't have as much sympathy because it was hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours that they had to like stop this. And so I'm like, they should have a long sentence. They had hours to help Shonda and they didn't. And they poured gasoline on her body while she was still alive and they helped light her on fire. So for them, sorry, I, I don't feel much sympathy. For him, for Miguel Martinez, I feel a little bit bad because I'm like, yes, it was horribly. Yes, you had plenty of opportunities to stop it, but I don't think that you should be put to death for that. That's just me. That's just my opinion. Obviously, let me know what you think. In 2002, luckily, depending on how you see it, his sentence was commuted to life in prison um, on the condition that he testify against Venegas because at this point, in 2002, the murders happened in 1991, and in 2002, Venegas still had not been convicted. And now I know what you're thinking. 11 years and you still hadn't been convicted? You're lying. I'm not, because here's what happened. Venegas was 16 at the time, and so the courts couldn't decide whether they were going to try him as a juvenile or an adult, and so they were just kind of like keeping him in custody while they were figuring this out, which I don't... I think it's interesting that they wouldn't choose to charge him as an adult because he was the one who committed the murders, but he had he had not admitted to it at this point, so I guess I get it. Anyway, he was kept in custody while they were figuring this out, and then in 1993, he was being held in a juvenile detention facility, and he escaped. He crossed the border into Mexico, and then he stayed there uncaptured for two years, like on the run from the American police. And eventually in, um, so this was back in 1993 and then in 1995, they found him in Monterey, Mexico and brought him back to the United States. And then in 2004, he was finally uh, tried as an adult and he pled guilty to three counts of murder. Now, the craziest part of all of this is that he pled guilty to three counts of murder, as I said, and he only got 41 years in prison. So obviously, he's still in prison. Miguel Martinez is still in prison, but Venegas very likely is going to be alive and, and released, whereas Martinez is serving a life sentence. And it's interesting because uh, how I learned about this story initially was from the Netflix show, I Am A Killer, and so both of them are interviewed within that series, and it's, interesting to see Martinez talk about it because he has kind of an inability to uh, to really be open about what happened. Like, yeah, he'll discuss what happened that night and, and his side of, of the story, but he really is hesitant to discuss certain things. And he's, he admits, he's like, I can't reconcile, I cannot reconcile in my brain how I'm going to be here for the rest of my life and Milo Flores didn't even get charged like he didn't even go to trial nothing and so the first time I watched that I was like dang like that that sucks like I felt super bad for him and I initially thought that his difficulty within talking about um what had happened and the events that transpired in January of 1991 I thought that that was like him being remorseful, him not wanting to talk about it, not wanting to be reminded of it because he just, he felt so bad. But then I watched it again. I watched like certain parts of it again to get quotes and it seems more to me like he doesn't want to openly talk about stuff because he's, he doesn't take responsibility for it and he thinks possibly that if he doesn't admit to certain things, he might be able to uh, have like a retrial or an appeal and, and if he doesn't claim responsibility he's gonna have more legs to stand on that's what it seems like to me and to me where I'm at is like I don't think that he should serve life in prison I think he should be allowed to uh, to have another chance to kind of get a lesser sentence or or do something you know make a deal because he did not kill anyone like Venegas has openly admitted at this point I killed all of them. 
he was there like I made him stab the bot like stuff like that you know while I understand why he's wanting to kind of keep things quiet I think he has to admit that he did have a part in this he played a major role within this whole thing and an example of something that like he won't take responsibility for is you know Venegas talks about the night he talks about oh you know Martinez wanted to go to this house part in particular he wanted to go to James's house it was his idea he had the key he said that they'd done it before like it was his idea to go to James's house and Martinez like claims that no there was no reason why we chose that house it was it was just a house like he, he specifically says there was no particular reason that we chose this house sir you had a key to the house you had robbed the house before obviously there was a reason that you guys went there it's it's just common sense you know that was the easiest target you had the key you knew that you had robbed it before and not gotten in trouble and so how does it make sense? Like, Venegas had never robbed Smiley's house before. He'd never gone with them. Whereas Martinez and Flores, they'd robbed it several times. And so it's just kind of like, come on. You got, you got to admit that it was your idea because you knew it was going to be easy. So it really just kind of seems like he's bitter that he's the one who got the longest sentence, which, uh, again, I 1,000% understand. And I think part of it is because he's, he's bitter and he's trying to... Um, keep himself in like a good position if he ever were to get like a retrial or something like that but I think part of it is because there may have been an element to Martinez's relationship with Smiley that not a lot of people are willing to take seriously I'm not gonna say it out loud but let me tell you why I think that Milo's dad said that when he was talking to Milo about the the events that had gone on that night, how they decided to go to that house, why they decided, all of this stuff. He said that they wanted to rob James because they were going to uh, trash someone's house to do something bad to someone who appeared to be good but was really bad. Those were Milo's words. And then when the interviewer asked Martinez about it, he directly said, uh, I think it's very clear what it means. I think the question is, what is the bad? And he just gets really choked up and kind of has to take a beat and breathe. And it's very, like, he talks about how there's a lot of stuff that he hasn't dealt with yet and stuff that he hasn't thought about in a long time and he won't, like, give it real estate within his mind. And so... From that, it appears that there may have been an inappropriate relationship is the uh, delicate way that I will phrase that between Smiley and Martinez. And when he talked about that, I felt that genuine, oh, got it. And while anything like that absolutely does not give anyone the right to kind of take justice into their own hands, it doesn't give you the right to uh, if it happens, seek retribution on that person and murder them along with two just innocent bystanders who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I understand the hurt. However, the district attorney has very blatantly said that he thinks that this is only being talked about because people like to gossip. He said they found no evidence to substantiate the claims that James was predatory in any way whatsoever towards Martinez or any of the other young people that he interacted with. He said that he was like, it's disgusting that we even have to um, look into this. It's disgusting. I have to defend this because we looked into it and there wasn't anything. But now that I have to defend it, it puts like a stain on James just having to talk about it. And so I don't know, it gives me conflicting feelings because I like to believe in justice. And I like to think that if someone's accused of harming someone, the police are going to look into it and they're going to do that to the best of their ability. And they're going to, um, they're going to value justice within that investigation. But I also know that this grown man who is because he is grown now he is he's an adult 
I know that I saw him sit there and cry when asked about what does that mean? He's a man, he's a bad man who's pretending to be a good man and doing bad things, you know? So I think that just, it just all, it adds to the idea that I kind of abide by that most things in life are not black and white. Um, there's good and bad and, and conflicting feelings and, and facts sometimes conflict with how you feel. And I don't know, I just, I feel for him. I definitely do. Now, on the other hand, we've got Venegas, who just completely openly and with as much charisma as ever talks about what he did and what his part was in all of this. He admits that he did these heinous crimes. In his words, he calls it a heinous crime. And he's like, it's hard to recognize and admit that I committed this, but it, it does no good to lie about it. And he said that his 41 years is a slap on the wrist. He said, even if I do the full 41 years, it won't make up for even one of the lies I took. And I truly don't know if he is so, I don't want to say flippant, but like so accepting of his sentence because he knows he could have gotten it a lot worse. Or if it's because he uh, is just accepting what he did and saying like, yeah, I did it. I can't lie about it. And you know, one of those things where like, if you hold on to a lie for too long, it makes you sick. And so you, you just got to accept it for your mental health. I don't know what it is, but um, yeah, I kind of, I tend to agree. 41 years doesn't necessarily make up for the cold-blooded murder of three, two definitely innocent men and, and one man who, according to the law, was innocent. But I want to know what you think, so go ahead and leave me a comment down below letting me know what you thought of this story. Um, just kind of give me your opinion on it because as horrifying as those murders were, I still find myself sometimes conflicted about how I feel about each of the characters. And so I would love to hear what you think about it. And while you are leaving that comment, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel, I would really appreciate it. And if you have subscribed already, thank you so much. I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. With all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Thank you again so much for watching. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.